So we can start now. I think almost everybody is present. Welcome, good morning, all of you. And morning. today we are in lockdown, MCO again started in Malaysia. So let me introduce. Today our uh, speaker is Dr. Sumit Bodda. He is served as a senior vice president of Association of Prevention and Control of Rabies in India and having a number of publications in the field of rabies and delivered many scientific lectures in national and international forum. He was journal representatives for Association of Prevention and Control Rabies in several times. He holds the position of president of Association of Prevention and Control, West Bengal chapter, past president of Rotary Club, East Calcutta and also present president and served as assistant governor, Rotary International District 3291, safe chairman of disaster management, Rotary International District 3291 many times and lead the disaster management team for more than 18 years with Rotary International and founder of like member association of prevention of control rabies in India, completed more than 45 years of professional service and on anti rabies and critical care management. He has chaired many sessions and workshops, rabies related subjects, attended many participants in many WHO, UNICEF and many national international agencies, sponsored scientific programs, participated and organized many uh, pro people activities like cardiopulmonary research education for more than 600 times in different parts of the country. And presently delivering lecture on disaster management CPR training, fast state training, and West Bengal police training. And he is trained in disaster management by Asian Disaster Preparedness Center, Philippines, and National Center of Disaster Management, Government of India, New Delhi, and mass casualty management as government sponsored candidate in NIDM, New Delhi 2009. Invented new technical device on administration of rabies immunoglobin in 2012. That is a patent and filed a multi-bore needle for RIG administration and design. So Dr. Shumit for the participant delivered talks on rabies and disaster management in many TV programs and also written many editorial, etc. newspaper, also editor of uh, rabies, uh, anti-rabies prevention journal. And also many write, have, you have write many books as I can tell you that one recently one book has been translated in Tamil and published in Lincoln. I can show you this and I just website I have been so that you can view. So this is a translated book in a handbook on rabies in Tamil so that the Tamil population community can read and understand about the rabies, the basic things. So. You can see this book in my hand. So without uh, his means, if I want to tell more, no need, I think. He has graduated from University of Calcutta and also MIPHA and also holding PhD degree from Lee University College. At So now I uh, want to hand over the microphone to Dr. Sumit Poddar, my elder brother, actually. So welcome, sir. Good morning for the wonderful uh, introduction. Uh, anyway, I am going uh, directly into the subject regarding our wound care management in relation with the animal bite wounds particularly. I am sharing the slides. Is it okay? It is viewable? Yes. Okay. okay. Thank you. 
things. <coughs> First of all, we'll have to think about the different types of wounds. In our day-to-day -day practice, we have seen many wounds and two things are basically there. One is the open wound, another is the closed wound. An open wound is an injury involving an external and internal break in the body tissue, usually involving the skin. Nearly everyone will experience an open wound at some point of time in their entire life. And the most open wounds are minor and can be treated in the home. The wounds can be classified into two. One is acute wounds and another is the chronic wounds. Acute wounds are defined as those which can heal in the very short time, short term of time. And chronic wounds are those which heal over eight weeks or longer with rather related complications. There are some examples of open wounds. There may be abrasion. It can occur when the skin rubs and slides against a rough surface. There is an abrasion. And examples of abrasion include a scrap knee or road rash. Although abrasions produce very little blood, it is important to sanitize the wound properly and remove any debris in prevent the infections. There may be some laceration, which also can be treated uh, in a deep opening wound, or open wound or opening, or a tear in the skin. Lacerations usually occur from accidents or incidents involving the knives, machinery or other sharp tools. And this type of wound may cause significant bleeding. Coming to the avulsion, it is also very important. An avulsion involves forcefully tearing away the skin and underlying tissues. Avulsions can result from violent incidents such as explosions, animal attacks, or motor vehicle accidents. There may be some puncture wound it is a small hole in the soft tissue. Splinters and needles can cause acute puncture. And at that, that time, the wounds are the only affect the outer layers of the tissues. However, knife or gunshot wounds can damage deep muscles and internal organs, which may result in significant bleeding, injuring the deeper, deeper tissues. Another important is the incision. An incision is a clean, straight cut in the skin. Many surgical procedures use incisions. However, accidents involving knives, razor blades, broken glass, and other sharp objects can cause incisions. Incisions usually cause heavy, rapid bleeding, deep incisions, and damage in the muscles or nerves and will most likely require stitches or repair. And this is the basic treatment of minor wounds, just uh, adding the, after cleaning the wound properly with povidine iodine and covering with a gauge pad. Minor or acute open wounds may be required medical treatment. People can treat this type of wounds at their own homes. And however, severe open wounds that involve the significant bleeding will require immediate medical and surgical attention. Open wound care should involve some of the following things. Number one, basically stop of bleeding, then cleaning of the wound, then treat the wound with antibiotics. And in a few days later, if there is a strong, huge gap is there, that those wounds can may require skin grafting. Close and dressing the wound, routinely change of dressing is another important part. And X-ray should be done in this kind of wounds to look for broken bones, fractures, open or comminuted fractures is that they are or not. X-rays may also be helpful in looking for foreign objects that may have been embedded in their laceration. 
Fluoroscopy done at the bedside may help find foreign bodies that are deeply buried. Ultrasound may also be used to assist in the diagnosis of foreign bodies in the wound. Fluoroscopy and ultrasound are only available in the emergency department of the hospitals. Look here, there is a wound. From the wrist the joint, there is an open wound was there. And this is a picture just two days back. This is the wound. The patient reported with me uh, crushed injury just uh, in the breast in the uh, machine. And this is after repair. This is the picture of that wound. The patient is still admitted in our clinic. So basically, this is the management of different kinds of wounds. And I know that regarding this wound management, uh, there are many uh, eminent speakers who have already presented this one. This is a short guideline uh, regarding the proper deliberation of the wounds. Now, the important part is there is some specific points in the management of animal bite wounds. We know that the animal bite wounds should be taken care of because of uh, development of rabies, particularly if, if this can be any bite from the bite or leaks, uh, bite, uh, major bites can be treated because otherwise, if no proper treatment can be done, there is chance of development of rabies and capillitis uh, for okay. the patient. So it is very, very, very valuable in managing an animal bite wound. Because we know human rabies death, the global picture is really, uh, India, you can see, see that it is a very, uh, vast country and as well as it is an endemic country, particularly in the field of rabies. So 59,000 deaths per year is globally, 21,000 deaths per year in India and 58 deaths per day in India. It is a very alarming picture. Although this picture was taken, this figure was taken uh, more than 10 years back, but today even if we miss the main important part, treatment for any animal bite wound uh, needs proper wound care management, proper vaccination, and proper rabies immunoglobulin infiltration because rabies will not give second chance to treat. And in this aspect, management of wound bites uh, is very uh, important. So, so there is a huge size of the problem is global death already I mentioned, and death in Asia is 59.6%. Death in Africa, it is 36.4%. And death in India, presently it is now 12,700, we are assuming. And furious rabies in India in 2005 as per MDS. So this is the size of the problem. Annual human rabies mortality, it was think the thought that 20,000, it has come down to 12,700. Now, frequency of rabies human, human death was one in every 20 minutes. Now it has also come down. Animal main reserve is the dogs, cats, mong mongoose, foxes, and jackals. Dog population is another factor. They are always biting, and there is the bite, maybe a lacerated bite, there are sharp teeth bites. Uh, and there are 28 million of dog population. Paid dog man ratio is also there. And annual man is lost due to the animal bite is 38 million. It is very important. And annual medical cost for animal bite treatment is near about rupees 2 billion approximately. So if we can treat this uh, wound properly, then we'll have to categorize all the wounds. One is a category one, category two, and category three. Especially, it is important for uh, uh, for managing the uh, any any uh, dog bite cases and through the categorization. So, category category one does not require any management except wound wash only, the touching or feeding of animals. Licks on intact skin means nothing is uh, needed if reliable cases is available and only the wound can be washed. 
Second is category two. It is also non-transdermal bite, and this can be treated only for wound wash. And the most important aspect is the category three. That is single or multiple transdermal bites or scratches is there and leaks on the broken skin, contamination of mucous membrane with saliva. And it is a local treatment of wounds are very important. Administration of rabies immunoglobulin in this aspect is very important. And also as well as rabies vaccine should be given. And other things are mainly we can see the different categories. That is category one, there is no wound. Naturally, only wound wash can be done. But in case of category two, there is one wound, non-transdermal wound. The vaccination is enough along with the wound wash. And these are the dangerous and critical animal bite wounds. We can see that the main portion of that bite side there's a huge bite site. So these wounds have been, uh, has to be taken personal care. First of all, 15 minutes wash with uh, soap and water because the virus contains a glycoprotein and that glycoprotein is already washable. Otherwise, these glycoproteins are responsible for the viral attachment. So we'll have to wash the wound first of all. Second important thing is administration of rabies immunoglobulin. I'm coming into that one. Look the structure, the deeper structure, is there uh, any vessel injury or not? We can see the vessels also. And this, if there is a vessel injury, only that part of the vessel has, should be ligated, but not giving any stitches. Because these wounds initially, after rabies immunoglobulin administration is 100% life-saving, and the stitches has to be done secondary closer of the wound or skin graft or anything else that should be done after two weeks of time. Why this is two weeks of time is necessary? That is mainly uh, due to the antibody response, that antibody titer will be on protective level on day 14. That is more than five international units. Uh, in repeat. So this is very important. Before that, we cannot do stitches. As because if you give stitches, these primary wounds during after the exposure, then there will be creation of the many ports due to the, and through that ports, viral entry will be there. So stitches as per WHO guideline, as per NCDC guideline, as well, for our APCRI guidelines, there is, these wounds cannot be stitched initially within, uh, without going uh, 14 days time when we'll give the vaccine as well as rabies immunoglobulin has to be infiltrated throughout all the wounds as per body weight. So it is very important because it is something different from other wounds. Why we have chosen these uh, wounds? Because, well, there is a clear-cut difference between management of simple wounds that I have shown in the slides, and these are the animal bite wounds. There is a lot of difference. Again, I'm telling that these differences has to be taken care of properly. This is a patient has reported to us with a bite wound in the tip of the nose. So this patient has been properly treated with in rabies immunoglobulin infiltration. It was a rabid dog bite. And after that, we have given the vaccination, completion after completion of the vaccine. And after two weeks of time, we have repa repaired that wound uh, under uh, microscopic surgery and uh, plastic reconstruction was done. And ultimately, the side by side, that photograph is after repairing of this wound of this particular patient. Again, I'm telling there is a lot of difference. We cannot close this wound primarily because there will be chance of development of rabies even after wound wash and everything. So it has to be taken care. That is the main importance of managing a dog bite or a cat bite or an animal wound bite. So first of all, in these cases, there's some specific 
treatment is there. Number one is the local treatment of wounds. Since the rabies virus usually enters the human body through a bite or scratch of a rabies infected animal, it is important to remove the saliva containing of rabies virus at the site of bite of physical or chemical means. This can be done by prompt and gentle thorough washing with soap and detergent and flushing of the wound with running under running tap water for at least 15 minutes of time. After washing with water and soap, disinfectants like provision iodine or surgical spirit, these are all viricidals and it must be applied. If soap or antiviral agent is not available, the wound should be thoroughly washed with water. Another important thing, this is the steps in toilet and primary care. So again, I'm telling there is a lot of difference of managing this type of wounds and then open wound and other, other, other wounds. So this is the basic thing, physically washing, chemically application of uh, povidone iodine and then inactivation of the virus and then administration of rabies immunoglobulin to neutralize the virus. So this is very important. And tetanus and antibiotic prophylaxis should be given if required. So it is also an important part to uh, at least to protect against tetanus also. These are wounds. All the wounds will have to give properly as a routine measure. These tetanus antitoxins should be given. So suturing of the wounds. This is suturing of the wounds should be avoided. In these cases of lacerated wounds with severe bleeding where suturing cannot be avoided, the wound should be first be infiltrated with rabies immunoglobulin. And minimum number of stay sutures can be applied, but usually it has to be avoided. But if it is inevitable, then the rabies immunoglobulin should be infiltrated thoroughly throughout the wound, totally, and uh, if suturing needed, the cosmetic purposes is preferably done after two weeks of time of starting the vaccination. At least three doses of vaccine should receive. And on day 14, the suture, suture can be done. So initially, if it is inevitable for suturing during the primary uh, reporting of the wounds, then rabies immunoglobulin in thoroughly infiltrate and then give one or two stay sutures at final suturing and the closure of the wound should be done after two weeks of time. So this is a patient. Just see, this patient should need some sort of suturing, but uh, just one or two suture has been given, only stay sutures, and but before that, we'll have to infiltrate the wound properly. As we can see, that uh, already after uh, infiltration, uh, then we'll have to give one or two to stay sutures. And after that, two weeks of time, that patient has to be given proper uh, plastic uh, surgery reconstruction of the wound. So management of animal bite are very important because rabies, again, I'm telling, does not give second chance to treat. So two things are important. One is pre-exposure, that means three doses of vaccination should be given and so only to avoid administration of the rabies immunoglobulin. And one is the post-exposure. And all these things are post-exposures. So in post-exposure period, again, we'll have to treat the wound properly as per scheduled guideline. So first of all, re-administration is needed. And second is the vaccine. First of all, when we are neutralizing the virus, then after three doses of vaccine administration, the antibody, tight, antibody response will get on day 14. So why rig not vaccine alone? That is also an important aspect. This rabies immunoglobulin also gave to neutralize the virus. That is the thing. And there is in Asian schedule, where five doses of vaccine can be given four to five doses and in interdermal schedule we are administering four doses of vaccine day zero day three day seven and day 21 or 28 that is the dose so rabies immunoglobulin 
is a life saving in particularly this type of wounds who apcra indian rabies survey 2004 revealed that the usage of rig was as low as 2% in the country but it should be uh, taken care so that the uh, in all cases of category 3 exposure uh, it should be given properly there is a history of rigs i don't want to elaborate this one because uh, it uh, in the year of 1980 uh, 1890 prevention rabies days back to 90, when babes of the first time demonstrated the utility of experimental animals from the onwards till 1945 many experiments and field studies was done to assess the usefulness of passively administered rabies antibody in prevention of rabies but these provided conflicting results ranging from 100 percent protection to no protection initially and so, <clears throat> usefulness of rabies immunoglobulin, first of all, in 1945 by Hebel and his colleagues, after a series of carefully controlled animal experiments, ARS was given, and in 1955, Koprowski and others could reproduce similar results. So, these are the histories, in a short, uh, the why we are administering rigs. And uh, there are many instances also there. It will nothing be related with these uh, uh, topics today. So I'm skipping the slides. And indications already been mentioned. So it is nothing to repeat one. But in case of category two exposures, in immunocompromised and immunosuppressed patients, the patient also has to be given uh, rabies immunoglobulin to neutralize the virus at the site of entry. So it is very important uh, regarding the types of the eats. There are many uh, rigs are available, equine origin, human origin. The dose is different. And monoclonal antibody now is taken in the consideration. It is rich in antibodies, recombinant rabies map. Dose is 3.33 international unit per kg of body weight. And next is our cocktail monoclonal antibody also it can destroy or neutralize the virus of rabies and rabies related diseases can be killed and this is the mechanism of action because virus into the nerve endings are there and virus neutralization of rig is there so this is the method we'll have to infiltrate the rabies immunoglobulin along the wound inside the wound and it is very important as because i am uh, i have seen many patients with failures of treatment and these are only as a result of patient was not given properly rabies immunoglobulin or the wound was closed primarily so this is the result of uh, different studies and also in multiple exposures we can do if there is a huge wound then the uh, rabies immunoglobulin can be diluted with normal saline and should be administered throughout all the wounds. So persons in re exposure suppose a patient of animal bite uh, of this kind of wound who has received previously full course of vaccination along with rabies immunoglobulin, then these patients should be uh, not, do not require any rabies immunoglobulin administration. That is important thing. Once the patient has taken a full course of vaccination, pre-exposure or post-exposure, whatever it may be, then these patients, after uh, producing to us, after coming to us in our clinic, with even so severe bites, these patients usually need only wound wash properly, thoroughly to wash out the, out the virus at least 50%, and as well as rabies immunoglobulin in those cases may not be needed in these cases. So it is very important and only vaccination is there and two doses of vaccine can cure the patients. One is on day zero and another is on day three. So what I was telling, uh, there are, in spite of managing this kind of wound, not properly, there are causes for the many causes of the post-exposure prophylactic failures are there. Number one, we cannot deviate 
this from the WHO PEP schedule. That is the post-exposure prophylactic schedule. We cannot deviate. That is for number one, proper wound toilet. Second thing, if it is a bleeding wound, give rabies immunoglobulin. A, and number third is the vaccination. If there is a huge wound, we'll have to basically, we'll have to after washing the wound properly and then two weeks after two weeks of time, the secondary switcher can be given and the patient should receive must, must and must rabies immunoglobulin uh, infiltration because this rabies immunoglobulin can neutralize, neutralize the uh, virus at the time of the uh, entry. So it is very much important. Poor or no wound care. So wound care is basically is very important in all aspects. And if there is not proper wound care, then there may be also cause of failure. Poor quality of vaccines. So we'll have to use this kind of vaccines, good quality of vaccines. Well, that may be, may be purified chicken brow cell vaccine, or this may be our purified viral cell vaccine, which is globally available. So it should be given, and rabies immunoglobulin, proper rabies immunoglobulin should be given and it should be infiltrated into the all wounds. That is another important. Now, in case of immunocompromised victim, these kind of wounds should be treated with thorough wound wash, 15 minutes to at least 30 minutes of time with soap and water. That is the only thing. Next, I will have to give rabies immunoglobulin administration. Then our vaccination should be given. And if there is large inoculum of virus, that is also one of the cause for the post-exposure prophylactic failure cases. So we must be, we have reported in our journal at least three, three times regarding the causes for the treatment-related failure, particularly this kind of wound. We have seen, taken the history, the wound has not taken care for proper wound wash and proper wound management was not done. So this is a patient of Shubhajit Mandal, a patient reported to us with a bite wound in the face as well as in the anterior, left anterior chest wall. And this patient after bite very soon, within seven days of time, developed rabies encephalitis. And here is the hydrophobia, signs of hydrophobia is there, the signs of our uh, aerophobia is there. And so this patient was not taken care primarily for the wound management. So wound management, particularly this is a child of six years of age. So wound, wound management is very plays an important role, equal role for managing any animal bite wounds. So it has to be taken care and otherwise it will be fatal like this. And Control of rabies prevention, human rabies prevention is there, dog rabies pre prevention is there. Human rabies prevention, post-exposure, pre-exposure. Those two kind of treatment are there. And dog rabies, mass vaccination of dogs, and dog population management is important. And increased access to vaccination is very important. Another important is we, we need to teach the local public of the community so that they can take care regarding their initial management of the wound toilet. That is very important. And each and every doctor in the center, in the either in the hospital or in the private sector, should know there is a basic difference in managing wound management in animal bite cases and wound management in other general cases. There are the two basic principles are there and one is very different with the other. So it has to be taught, it has to be taken care and it sh should be aware properly throughout the entire community as well as for the doctors. So to conclude, Rabies immunoglobulin are essential. Again, I am telling because life saving in all category three exposures. The currently available equine rabies immunoglobulin is a good one, purified, safe, can be given. It is cheaper. 
H rig is also given, but it is very uh, costly and monoclonal antibody can be given already and cocktail monoclonal antibody also can be used for the rabies immunoglobulin administration. Now, it is an important aspect. We have already discussed regarding the fatality of these cases. But to summarize, I can say there are few cases being reported for the survival from the rabies encephalitis. And some cases are being reported during the period of 1970 to 2014, and particularly in the two years, four survivors from India also reported. If the life scan, life can be prolonged with supported treatment in intensive care unit, immune mechanisms and make clear the virus. So, hence, attempts to treat paralytic rabies should be practiced. In all these cases, we have seen that wound toilet was practically properly done, and but uh, as well as there are some uh, points has to be skipped, have, was skipped. So it should be very methodical so that we can treat those cases. Never therapeutic in the, uh, and in newer therapeutic interventions, including immunomodulation needs to be assessed and specific antiviral if discovered may play an important role which can act as a adjunct therapy. So animal bite wound management is a life saving. Hence, any animal bite wound should, be should not be neglected. Stitching of animal bite wounds, these are the key points are contraindicated. It may be done after full infiltration of rabies immunoglobulin or secondary suture can be done after two weeks of time and already I have given the detailed outline, the basic differences for managing this kind of wounds and animal bite wound. It is the standard protocol which should be followed in every aspect as rabies does not give second chance to treat. So to conclude, death in rabies is inevitable. And this treatment aims at prevention a high quality vaccine is required for preventive aspect. Thorough wound management is to be needed. Purified cheek embryo cell culture vaccine and with treatment more strain or modern virocell vaccine is the drug of choice. If can be administered by intermuscular muscular or interdermal roots with 100% of cell conversion in two weeks of time. So basically, these are the basics of wound management in animal bite of cases. And so we have seen that the patient supposed taken rabies immunoglobulin, the patient has taken full course of vaccination, but not done the wound management properly. There are many patients is reporting to us with stitched wound after following so animal no, bite cases. Yeah. Mind it, please. This cannot be done. It is an offense. So basic pathological difference from managing the animal bite wound and simple wound or other wounds is totally different. So regarding this uh, management of animal bite wound is very much is to be has been given this another focus to treat the proper patients properly. Yes. We have a dream of rabies free world for which we have a vision. It is a time to convert this dream into reality. If successful, we could hope for a better and healthier tomorrow. Thank you very much for your patience, kind patience hearing. If there is any questions regarding managing the animal bite wound in relation with the other wounds, I'm ready to uh, hear the questions and we'll be able to say, answer the uh, if there is any demerits, uh, any, any, any question regarding managing the animal bite wounds. I'm sure I'm, uh, I'll be able to give you a proper another aspect if you want to know. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, really, thank you very much for your patience sharing. Thank you, sir. And thank uh, you. we are 
uh, thankful for your presentation. With us, we have already Professor Dr. Hong from, but uh, he has the next speaker, but he has some, uh, Sarah is here with us, you can see, but Sarah has some cons uh, surgery cases scheduled. So he has to go. So he has sent the recorded video. We'll play after this. So any question, Professor Hamui is there, our deputy dean from our medical campus, and all respected delegates also present. So any question, please ask. Feel free to ask. Dr. Hadi also here. Any question from anybody? You can directly ask. I can see chat box. OK, Dr. Can, Yes. Can doctor highlight one uh, monkey bites a bit? Yes, yes. Regarding the monkey bite, uh, actually the same protocol has to be followed. But only in case of human bite, the protocol is different. Because human bite does not give uh, any possibilities for developing rabies in a country, in a in this type kind of bites, what human bite can do, that is, AIDS can be there, transmitted, hepatitis can be transmitted, anaerobic infection, and tetanus. In case of monkey bite, the same management is there. The monkey sometimes may be rabid one, and so if the incidence is less, in case of monkey bite, we have seen the patient develop rabies uh, the less number of cases, but there is still possibilities of development of rabies in case of monkey bite. The same arrangement, the same mechanism, the same wound toilet, same treatment protocol should be followed in case of also in case of monkey bite. Thank you. Another question is there from Dr. Cheril. She is asking that is the vaccine given routinely? as in included in the children vaccination program in India? Yes, Madam, this is wonderful suggestion from you. The government should think in such a way that in immunization schedule, the vaccination should be done as per uh, our national immunization guideline. The rabies should be included. And if we can include this one, if we can give three doses of vaccine in the children, one is on day zero, one is on day seven, and one is on day 21 or 28, the main advantage in case of uh, bite, any animal bite, this child will need, will require only two doses of anti rabies vaccine. One is on day zero, one is on day three. And in those cases, rabies immunoglobulin administration is not needed. Usually what happens, I'm telling, that in case of children, there may be a bite in the tip of the fingers. Suppose the child is having a body weight of 15 or 20 kg, then the amount of rabies immunoglobulin to be infiltrated in the tip of the finger is very uh, huge amount. And that may lead to the development of compartment syndrome. So these, uh, to avoid this one, this is a wonderful suggestion, suggestion, madam, from your part, that it should be, in India, it should be included in the national immunization, in the immunization schedule so that this patient, this child can get rabies vaccination during their post schedule time of immunization only on this aspect for that to avoid the rabies immunoglobulin only vaccination in limited dose day zero and day three will give adequate protection because once we have given the vaccine that comes in the memory cells and this second and uh, day zero and day three dose will develop just to boost up the memory cells and will give, will uh, definitely afford high antibody response in the exposure cases. So that is the cause main, mainly. And one day will, I hope, one day it will come when it will be included in the national immunization schedule. Thank you. And another question is there from Madam. Is there any difference 
in administering the ig locally over the wound instead of im over deltoid any study or experience regarding this yes yes there are many 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 uh, studies many experience is there now what we are recommending because these are the rabies immunoglobulin and these are the ready made antibodies and if we give in locally it will get a better action only to neutralize the virus at the site of the entry now we are not giving anything remnant part or any 50% local 50% uh, uh, in the muscle we are not giving because 50% administration of rabies immunoglobulin is simple wastage so we only give the rabies immunoglobulin locally the object will be fulfilled and in these cases in all cases the neutralization of virus is 100% achievable by administering the rabies immunoglobulin locally there are many studies we can search the internet also recent studies will show and who is also recommending this amount uh, of administration of rabies immunoglobulin locally if there is only a single few few uh, portion of the rabies immunoglobulin remnant left then this can be given but it is has got a very little effect the, so we will have to give the standard protocol give rabies immunoglobulin fulfill the purpose of neutralize the virus at the site of entry that is the thing uh, so another question from dr khadija she asking that dr i want to ask you how about the snake bite it is need be debridged immediately or need to wait till the demarcated snake bite is not my subject anyway the basic management in snake bite is find out the bite mark and instead of wasting time there is no role of applying tunicate in the regarding the bite site the only thing is the patient has to be given directly transferred to the primary health center or in a hospital so that the patient can be uh, treated with uh, our uh, serum that is a anti venom serum that has to be given the only thing only problem is in case of kalach snake bite you know that is another kind of snake usually it is found in the just uh, in the lobby or a, if the patient lies in the uh, open veranda uh, just uh, inside the outside the room or inside the room there is a bite and it it is so min minor and very small bite that the uh, patient cannot uh, experience that type now the patient comes in the in front of the doctor with the history of just a pain abdomen doctor treats then again on the second day again this patient reported to the doctor with the pain in the throat and joint pains okay again he has been given the and analgesic drug and on the third day onwards the patient reported with ptosis of the eyes i so in ptosis that is a sign of this kind of snake bite already the patient is reported to the doctor with a delay time so this patient has to be then and then transferred to the hospital they need to give immediate anti venom injection so that by this way uh, this patient can be saved uh, anyway i am not an expert in the field of snake bite sir and madam both everybody i am telling at anyway this is the experience that i gathered throughout the entire my practicing life of 45 years so i have seen this many cases are there so meticulous history taking is a, a very important thing it has no other options so we'll have to take the history properly we'll have to examine the patient with all this his all this patient because uh, primarily we could not miss but will everything in nb patients will have to 
diagnosed accordingly uh, we, after taking the proper history and the clinical findings. Okay. Thank you. Another question from Dr. Maniam. How is outcome wound healing in secondary suturing? It's a wonderful thing. I have never seen a secondary after administering, controlling the infection and everything, secondary suture heals everything. There may be a scar, but uh, it, it is really is, uh, I have never seen that any secondary suture uh, following the maintaining the proper uh, guidelines, uh, proper technical uh, uh, skill, the uh, secondary sutures you right. I have shown you the photograph of a uh, bite in the nose. I have I've shown you. That is a wonderful example that a proper meticulous stitching after two weeks of time, particularly in case of dog bite cases, are really is very good. And in some cases, skin grafting is needed when there is a tissue, uh, more granulation tissue is there, we'll have to wait then after the development of granulation tissues, then we can go for, for the uh, plastic reconstruction. And there are many cases also uh, in hand injuries. It is another subject, important subject, subject where in hand injuries, there are many, many wounds are there. It should be primarily treated with uh, skin grafting and as well as because hand is a part of the body, most vital part of the body, and we'll have to treat it properly in the primary, primary uh, when the patient will report to us. So these are the main things, basics of the any any kind of surgeries. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Maniam. And any other question? Just I want to show you one thing that in Malaysia, we know that rabies also here and death occurring every now and then. You can see my screen, the news. In three weeks ago, Sarawak, one patient died with rabies. So all this is going on in November 2020, one month ago. So. Uh, these all many cases are they are reporting. They are uh, means one by one. So it is a means great disease, which is but it can be prevented by taking vaccine. Not like our coronavirus, which is no vaccine and we have to fight every day. So thank you. Uh, I must for... thank. I must thank. Uh, Dr. Shodhi Poddar for and Dr. organizing for, and everybody for organizing the wonderful program. For honor, really, these are the need mainly. Anyway, thank you, Shodhi, and thank you, sir, all has attended here. Thank you very much. I am also uh, conveying our best wishes for the rest of the year, for the rest of 2021. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm and our next speaker is uh, Dr. Hong. I will uh, share after maybe we can give a just one two minute break if you want, or we can start sir, having some uh, what we called uh, surgery case. So he has given me the um, slide. I mean the video recorded lecture. Sir is here just now. So he, Professor Hong, will talk on reconstruction for diabetic foot. Professor Hong is a professor of plastic and reconstructive surgery, University of Ulsan, College of Medicine and Asian Medical Center. He has board certification in trauma, hand along with plastic I, surgery. I'm mute. He received his BS degree from the Wunsei University of College of Medicine and his MS degree in medicine and PhD degree from the Graduate School of Wunsei University. He received his MBA 
on medical management from University of Southern California at Marshall School of Business. He is an active member of a number of professional associations such as the American Society of Plastic Surgery, World Society of Reconstructive Microsurgery, and Korean Society of Plastic Surgery. His major work has been research and clinical practice in wound healing, diabetic foot reconstruction, and microsurgery. He is on the editorial board of numerous journals, including Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery, International Wound Journal, Journal of Reconstructive Microsurgery, Journal of Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery, and more. He has been invited in over 80 countries to present his work and his visiting professorship for more than 20 institutions. He has over 160 publications in the field of practice of 12 book chapters, including the Nelligan Plastic Surgery. He has recently awarded the Gordia Travel Fellowship from the 2015 American Society of Reconstructive Microsurgery. So now now I would uh, like to play the recorded video sir just to go out for the surgery case just I play. Any question you please write in the chat box so that I can, after Dr. Hong come back, he can reply or we can ask by email later if he come late. So I just start the video. Hello, my name is JP Hong from Seoul, Korea, plastic surgeon working at Asan Medical Center. It's good to see you today in this workshop hosted by the Lincoln University in Malaysia. Today I'll be talking about diabetic foot and especially focused on the aspect of reconstruction. Diabetic foot is such a large can find it. You need to understand about the soft tissue, and then you need to understand about the vascularity or the vascular component. So there's basically three major components involved in salvaging the diabetic limb. 
And of course, everything starts with having a good infection control, and that includes debridement, and then evaluating the vascularity, making sure that the patient has a certain amount of vascularity, understanding when you salvage the limb, one of the core purposes is to maintain function. So you have to understand the kinetics of the foot. And finally, if there's a huge defect that you have to cover with the soft tissue in order to do a limb salvage. And in addition to that diabetic limb salvage, surgical salvage component, there is the endocrinological aspect, nutrition, uh, the administration, and of course, there's a community practitioners where they have to see the patient in first line. And amidst that is the surgical nurse coordinator who would coordinate uh, between all these very difficult, different um, specialties. So we start to really recognize the, the, mm -hmm. the key members involved in treating diabetes and diabetic foot. And this is why we thought the team approach was very important. And when you have a very complex team, it is very important to have a coordinator who would coordinate among different specialties. And I think this is the key to having any successful diabetic limb salvage uh, practice. You have to communicate with the other specialties who will bring value to actually having the limb salvage and making sure that the patient maintains the foot. And, and then every discipline has to understand their roles and responsibility. And we all have to have a common goal of reducing the major amputation rate. And of course, there's the admin, uh, administrative support. And finally, this has to be based on um, uh, cordiality and respect among the team. So communication is one of the keys. And in the old flow, it was based on the consultation, but the new flow, now the uh, coordinator uh, finds where the patient needs to go first and then try to really bring a very efficient um, a con consultation and really minimize the lag time and really intervene as soon as possible. So having these protocols to allow the patient to have a more efficient flow is critical in having a, a good multidisciplinary approach. And as plastic surgeons, we have the ability to debride, to heal the wound, and also provide coverage through microsurgery or through flaps. But nevertheless, the true goal is to not only salvage the limb, but also is about to making sure that the patient uses that limb correctly and really has a second chance um, in uh, during uh, the next phase of that patient's life. So why was this very important at Asan Medical Center? Because we had a major amputation rate of around 22% when we began in 2005. So like I said before, out of these 22% patients, half of them will pass away. So this was incredibly high number. And this is why we set a goal as a team to reduce major amputation rate. And this is not easy because the management of the diabetic foot really involves a very, very wide spectrum of treatment. You have one spectrum where you have to treat the, uh, the nutrition balance, the blood sugar, educate the patients at the extreme uh, and the other end of the extreme spectrum, you have uh, where you have to um, provide surgical uh, means like amputation or other reconstructive surgeries. And in between, you have the good standard of care and also having uh, having in your utility bag these kind of more advanced treatments. So it's very difficult to really have a good idea on what the spectrum of the treatment is. And nevertheless, as part of being in the team, you have to understand this in order to really maximize the value that you're giving to the a patient by understanding um, everybody else's role. And of course, uh, in our center, it all begins by controlling the blood sugar level and making sure that the patient has a good nutrition level. And this is critical to really allow a good healing. And so, and we also monitor, uh, make sure the patient has good control over their blood sugar level by monitoring their uh, blood sugar level through using the IT platform. So through this, all the records are stored in the cloud. And then when, she, when the patient comes in, it allows the endocrinologist to actually look at the trend whether or not the blood sugar is being controlled well. And, mm -hmm. and our team recently published a, a, a paper showing that having these kind of IT platform control really allows the patient to have a better and a faster blood sugar level control. And same thing with monitoring. Now we're using scales like uh, mechanisms, scales like machines to actually monitor the temperature of the foot to see if there's early signs of inflammation. And of course, prevention and education is quite important to make sure that the patient uh, really 
uh, has um, understands what the patient is going through and make sure that the patient does not recur. And having that kind of video uh, education material, as well as these kind of booklets and having these kind of campaigns with the government really helps the patient understand what they need to do and what they need to expect and also how they should cope during the treatment and after surgery as well. So all this is the early spectrum of this diabetic wound care. And when the patient has a wound, then it's very important that you understand the good standard of care because good standard of care means everybody who does diabetic foot needs to understand uh, there is this principles of good care and everybody needs to understand this in order to provide this minimal uh, good standard of care. It all begins by controlling the infection and of course debriding. And in this, we have to have a common language or common classification where we could communicate with each other and say when it's 2B that we understand exactly the wound is penetrating to the tendon or capsule and it's infected. So the parties involved could be um, infection doctors, uh, the plastic surgeons, uh, and because the tendons are involved, possibly orthopedic. So, so these are the communication tool and basic understanding of the basic uh, classification. We also have to have a common, you also have to have a common way that um, cultures are being taken. If somebody does swab and somebody does tissue, then you know the sensitivity and the specificity is to be different. So in our center, we always say we unify, make sure that all the bacterial cultures are taken with a tissue bottle. That way everybody uh, has a common trust in the finding as well. We also try to avoid using different antibiotics and having a common broad, broad spectrum antibiotics in to build minimal resistance. Uh, proper assessment, uh, doing yes. debridement, whoever does, and these common goals are actually seen. And of course, using the right person, understanding the vascular supplies, doing offloading and, and the control of edema is also very important. And also important is the documentation process because whoever sees the patient, you have to understand whether or not this patient is getting better or getting worse. And documentation, making sure that you document then I love my wife uh, the you wound condition, you uh, the wound bed, and also the size of the wound is quite important to actually show if there is objective um, decrease in wound and whether or not it's being effectively managed by the current protocol. If the wound size does not change, then it means that you have to change the protocol. And this is why having these kind of objective monitoring system is very important. And we also use this kind of 3D imaging technique to actually measure not only the area, but the depth. So the volume of the wound is seen and we could actually see whether or not it's being uh, well controlled with the current regimen. And this has been actually shown to correlate very well and really provide the scientific background to determine whether or not the wound is getting better or worse. So having these kind of documentation is also very important to see the progress of the, of the wound care. And if these kind of uh, basic good standard of care doesn't work, then we have a lot of tricks up our bags, like stem cell therapy, gene therapy, cell therapy, hyperbaric oxygen, negative pressure, and growth factors. And I know that some of you have, may have used it uh, to a, quite of expen extent, but I just wanna quickly touch upon a couple of new ideas that we're using in the recent years. And one is using MPWT. And the reason why we use MPWT is actually to improve the circulation as well as to clean the wound and really augment uh, the granulation. So that's why we use MPWT. And in some cases, um, when the bone or the tendon are exposed, we like to use it in conjunction with graft or artificial collagens or, um, or allodermal graft. And when you use these scaffolds and use the NPWT together, you're able to augment or enhance the rate of the granulation and quickly uh, able to granulate over the tendons and bones and really get away by doing um, a, a quick skin graft instead of doing a very complex uh, reconstructive surgery. So using conjunction with these kind of scaffolds with NPWT really helps to augment wound as well. A lot of the times we use hyperbaric oxygen and the main reason that we use this is to actually see where the demarcation of the wound is. We have this um, A patient chamber and you could see that as the patient is doing hyperbaric oxygen, the wound, the margin of the wound 
or the wound where it's ischemic and where it's relatively viable could become very distinct. And when this, when is, and when this distinction, demarcation occurs, then we know that uh, amputation at this level shouldn't cause any uh, tissue breakdown. So using hypobaric oxygen to achieve good demarcation is also becoming a very essential part of our, our regimen as well. And of course, you have multiple growth factors that you could use. Uh, we have done studies using epidermal growth factors in conjunction with erythropoietin, EPOs, and have shown that they all have very good effect in trying to heal uh, these kind of grade two uh, ulcerations. So these are basically in the beginning of the spectrum. And I think in, in our opinion, that the key innovations that were made, even in this uh, relatively well-known area, the most important thing is doing multidisciplinary approach. I think this is by far the biggest and the most important innovation. You cannot do everything alone, but how do I work with other departments? How do I work with other surgeons and other uh, physicians? And how well do you coordinate and understand the roles uh, of each other and have a common goal? That is the key to having a good multidisciplinary approach. So doing that in conjunction with having good communication, setting a goal, I think that is the biggest innovation that had the biggest impact in treating diabetic foot. Of course, now we use IT, we use RT-PCR cultures. Of course, there are advances in good standard of wound care, and there are more advances in treatment, stem cell therapy, et cetera, et cetera. But nevertheless, I think the biggest key innovations in this non-surgical field is by far multidisciplinary approach and the right communication that needs to be made. <clears throat> Nevertheless, in these kind of very complex wounds uh, where they have transmetatarsal amputation, uh, where it's partially ischemic, <clears throat> the bones and tendons are very complexly exposed, you have to go think about the surgical options. And next, I'd like to talk about the basics in surgical options and also what kind of advances it has been made in the surgical uh, options as well. Now, when, when I was in resident and training, um, actually doing a lot of microsurgery on the diabetic foot was a contraindication. But we have shown that by understanding the vascularity that we're still able to do a reconstructive microsurgery and do the limb salvage. So the purpose of any reconstructive surgery is to really cure the wound, salvage the limb, make sure it's functional, weight-bearing, and of course, to provide an economical wound care solution. And I think the free flap has done that. So when you see a patient, the most important thing, again, is to make sure the patient has good nutrition, good uh, diabetic level, because if you don't, we all know that without proper um, nutrition and proper uh, uh, blood sugar level, you're gonna have problems, as shown throughout multiple papers of having an increased rate of complications. So it's very important. And when these are met, when these basic uh, systemic conditions are being well controlled and when the patient is indicated for reconstructive surgery, of course, it is indicated at, in patients initially where there's one very good major vessel or where the healing process has stopped for several weeks and there's not really a good uh, more means of doing conventional care. Uh, when there's bone exposure or infection of the bone, when the vital structure is exposed and when the wound is just complex and extensive. So these are the major indications. And if you're thinking about doing reconstructive surgery, whether it be local flaps or even free flaps, you have to think about the vascular status because the flaps is all about using the artery and vein. And if you don't think about that, you're going to have, you're going to go into a lot of trouble. So here in this patient, we evaluated by CT angiogram, which is one of the easiest way, non-invasive way to evaluate. And you could see here in this patient, the patient does not really have a dorsalis pedis. And also when you look at this kind of uh, reconstructed image, you could also see that the major femoral arteries are uh, obstructed and that the major um, collaterals going distally are the descending branch. So for example, if you're gonna harvest a flap based on this descending branch, which is the ALT, then you might have trouble. So understanding what is the status of the vascularity in the foot, as well as understanding the vascularity of where you're going to harvest the flap could be critical in having a good um, outcome. And when you do see these kind of um, poor vascular supply, of course the options are to, 
to improve the vascularity going to the feet. And in, a, in our center, uh, doing multiple or single angioplasties, we've actually seen that it increases the blood flow around 50 to 30%, which allows to really uh, help to have a better result. Now, if you're gonna do free flap, of course, the concept is raising a tissue with its own artery and vein, elevating it, and then putting in, in the recipient site, anastomosing the artery and vein, so the, the flap or the tissue will have its own blood supply and then ultimately able to heal the wound. Now, it's also very important that when you do um, debridement, especially in ischemic diabetic foot, that you debride the whole ischemic territory because the flap is being supplied by the surrounding tissue. So if the surrounding tissue is ischemic, then you might not get inosculation into the flap and it could cause late phase flap trouble. So it's very important that you remove all the ischemic territory, which is in conjunction with the angiosome concept in a lot of the times, and then make sure that the surrounding tissue has a good vascularity. Uh, here's a patient uh, with exposed bone and tendon. Again, first make the wound clean, and we like to debride and use MPWT to prepare the wound for good granulation, elevate the ALT, and use the dorsal pedis to do a flap. Uh, we like to use skin flaps as our ideal flap because we think the skin like with like, the skin probably works better uh, to resist shearing and to provide uh, the best functional outcome. The, when the flap is being raised and being anastomosed, the premises is that this patient will need at least one good major vessel. If the segments are calcified, we're going to find the segment that is uh, spared from calcification, or you could use a branch from the major vessel and if it's a stump, you could actually do an end-to-end. -end. So here's a patient with a first-ray ischemic um, <clears throat> problem. After revascularization, you can see the patient undergoes ischemia reperfusion injury, debridement of the first axis, elevate a thin skin flap from the ALT using the posterior tibial artery, and then you can see that it has a very nice contour and we're able to do a wraparound around the first ray and, and salvage the, this limb and salvage the first ray. And this has been used for 10, 10 years without any problems. Here's a patient with a severe calcification. When we opened the dorsal pedis, you could actually see severe calcification in the dorsal pedis, the posterior tibial artery, and um, the anterior tibial artery, but you could actually see this calcification spared segment. So we opened the artery and we're able to hook up uh, the flap end to side. And this is the final result, which we're able to salvage the limb as well. So the idea of microsurgery is, again, having at least one major vessel. Uh, if the vessels are calcified, use a calcification spared segment. And you maximize the flow if there is a vascular problem with angioplasties. And doing this way, uh, the classical microsurgery, uh, we've actually had around 92% of flap survival, 84.9% of limb salvage, and five-year survival rate of 86.8%. Remember. Um, two out of one, 50% of all major amputations will have a five-year survival of around 50%. So BKA at the same hospital as our hospital, five-year survival was only 41.4% uh, during the same time of this study. So it is worth it to do the reconstruction, salvage the limb, and not only provide a good flap and wound solution, but also um, provide longevity of the life itself. And this was very similar to other centers who showed similar results, such as the Georgetown group. So we've also evaluated factors in regards to failure. And, and we've actually identified that patients with multiple angioplasty, peripheral artery disease, really bad vascular condition. Um, patients who had less than one, and we had trouble, uh, who could have trouble doing the uh, microsurgery. And patients who also use immune suppression really had a high chance of failure. So if you're gonna start doing these kind of diabetic foot reconstruction, it will be prudent uh, to actually avoid these kind of high risk patients and start with the more easier cases and then basically build your way up uh, doing more complex um, diabetic foot reconstruction. But what about for these severe ischemic diabetic limb, as you can see here in this patient, the patient rarely, barely has any uh, flow going into the distal limb. 
And a lot of the times, if you look at this ischemia here, even though this patient doesn't have major vessels, somehow the, the rest of the foot or the rest of the foot here is getting supplied. Even though there's no dorsalis pedis, there's no anterior tibial, there's no peroneal. So what can we do for these kind of ischemic patients? Because they have no major vascular supply, does that mean that we just have to amputate? And this is the, and this is the field where the idea of using um, more smaller vessel surgery, which is called supermicrosurgery, uh, really comes into play. Supermicrosurgery is using vessels less than 0 .8, 0 0.8 millimeters. So that's then one millimeter and actually using that as an artery and vein to hook up the flap and make sure the flap gets perfusion. So why is this relevant in the field of ischemic diabetic foot? Because remember, we talked about angiograms, uh, angiosomes. And when the patient has ischemia, it actually follows these angiosomes. And by following these angiosomes, even though the patient does not have any major vessels, there are multiple collaterals in the next angiosomes. And when there are multiple collaterals, you could actually use these small vessels stemming from these collateral vessels and use that as a recipient and hook up the flap. And we've actually seen very good result. And remember, the surrounding tissue has small vessels. So after doing complete angiosome dependent debridement, look for these small vessels in the next, next angiosome territory. And what we also found out was that as the patient goes through ischemia, as the ischemia develops slowly, and as the major vessels are occluded, what we find is that the number of neovascularization, the number of new branch, the new numbers of new branches increase significantly, and also the diameter of these collateral vessels also increase. So that gave us the idea to sort of think about using these kind of collateral vessels, not major vessels, as the recipient. And of course, using the ultrasound, identifying which vessels have to give 15 to 20 centimeters per sec or more of velocity really helps you to choose the right recipient even in the absence of major vessels. So we'd like to use the ultrasound. So here you could see actually two very nice case of demonstration of doing um, uh, super microsurgery. Here, this patient has amputated part of his um, ischemic uh, territory and we go to the next angiosome and we're able to see this nice uh, dorsal pedis. Here on the right, ischemic web space um, uh, diabetic foot. And you could actually see, look, the angiogram shows no distal flow. So this patient is being supplied only by collateral. And after angioplasty, we're able to open up a little bit more vessel, but nevertheless, there's a lack of uh, anterior tibial artery. So here, after identifying a small vessel, we decided to elevate uh, the posterior enterosis artery, a perforated flap. And then after we harvest, we go down to the feet and start doing the uh, reconstruction. This perforator, as you can see, surrounding is, surrounding is fat. It's above the D fascia. And you, we, I always like to do the vein first. So this flap hooks up to the vein. And remember, this patient does not have dorsal pedis. It just has a revascularized, a very weak posterior tibial and multiple collaterals. But when we open the, uh, the perforator, even though there's no major vessel, look how much pulse it has. And same here in this digital artery, it has a very strong pulse, so we're able to do side to end um, on this to hook up the flap. And here we're cutting the perforator. And just based on the collateral flow, no major vessels, just based on the collateral flow, it has a wonderful perfusion allowing us to do reconstruction. And here after the anastomosis, you could see after removing the clip, how much nice pulsation it has. So this is the things that we could do nowadays using these kind of small vessel surgery. So here are some more clinical examples. Uh, again, first ray uh, ischemia, after reperfusion, you can see that inflammation. Debride, find the small perforating branch from the posterior tibial, and then elevate the skip flap, and this is the final result without any secondary revisions. So you could see how thin it is. Here in this patient, again, transmetatarsal amputation, dorsal pedis calcified, posterior tibial calcified, but using a small, small branch uh, from uh, multiple collaterals, we're able to salvage this limb and have a good transmetatarsal um, reconstruction. So here in chronic osteomyelitis of the first toe, 
we're able to debride, use the digital artery end to side to hook it up without amputating the first toe. So we all know how important the first toe is and we're able to salvage the limb. Here again, if the patient had uh, amp amputation of the transmetatarsal level, because of the lack of the tissue to close primarily, uh, this patient will probably have breakdown. Now this patient has a good demarcation after hyperbaric oxygen. So we, we, we amputate transmetatarsally, elevate the ALT, hook it up to a small vessel, and this is the final result. So the patient is able to salvage his limb and actually walk on his uh, reconstructed foot. So the idea behind um, the supermicrosurgery and diabetic foot is that you use a small, small vessel, the end vessel, uh, which is less than 0.8. And this is being supplied by the collateral vessels. So you don't need a major vessel. Of course, you remove all the ischemic territory and then you maximize the flow to these perforators by doing multiple angioplasties. So using these small perforating end vessel is the key to doing supermicrosurgery. And this is a real advancement because despite the fact you don't have major vessels like the anterior tibial or posterior tibial, you could always go to the small vessel to do the anastomosis. And our result actually shows that the flap survival was around 90.5%. Limb salvage rate was about 93.7%. So that was slightly actually better than doing classical uh, microsurgery. And of course, the, uh, the, the, the odds ratio of failure also decreased significantly, even though the patient does not have one vessels, even one major vessels, or even with in, the, uh, in the presence of the peripheral artery disease, the odds ratio had dropped from 20 times to around 11 times significantly using this supermicrosurgery approach. Now, what is interesting is that, again, to emphasize on the vascularity, uh, the heel defect is the most difficult place to heal using reconstruction because it's a watershed area. The peroneal and the posterior tibial, sometimes they're both bad. And even if you do a flap, you only have, in our hands, we only have a 73% success rate. So, so these are very, very high chance of failure. And when you only have collateral versus when you have a, a dominant artery, the failure becomes 80 times. But when you use a major artery, the failure time, I mean, when you have a major vessel, at least from what, at least going to one side, then you have a little bit less uh, chance of failure. So when you're doing heel reconstruction, you have to make sure that you have at least one major axial artery, either the posterior tibial or the peroneal supplying the heel. The, heel. the post-operative care, of course, it's always about subjective observation, um, making sure that post-op the patient is uh, tolerating well and not, having, not building infection by checking ESRCRP. And of course, we'd like to monitor the flap using um, uh, um, extensively the duplex ultrasound. And what's really interesting in, in these kind of ischemic diabetic foot reconstruction that we know that after um, angioplasty, the restenosis rate could be high as 60% in two months. So sometimes in the late phase, the patient suddenly comes and say, oh, my flap looks very pale, what's wrong? And the, the chances are this patients will have a more proximal level obstruction. So here's a case that I'd like to show is uh, we basically um, debrided the plantar side and, and you can see that the angiogram shows relatively good vascularity. So we use uh, the medial plantar artery as the major source and we hook up this skip flap using this uh, uh, branch from the, um, from the, from the medial uh, plantar artery. And you can see the angiogram here, the, the flap looks pretty pale. So we decided to look into an angiogram and you can see that there's no major vessel going into this flap. So what's wrong? So we decided to uh, use the angiogram and we could actually see that more proximal to the anastomosis, there was an obstruction. So in this case, open up with a balloon angioplasty. And then, sorry about that. And then you could actually see that the flow to the flap after opening up with a balloon angioplasty just becomes much better. And you could actually see the, the, the perforator going into the flap and we're able to salvage. So this is why, again, multidisciplinary team is very important. If you see late um, uh, flap with ischemia, then of course you have to ask to do emergency angioplasty and actually see whether the problem is more proximal or the problem is in the flap itself. 
So again, this is the more, this is why this kind of multidisciplinary approach becomes so important. So we also talked about the reconstructive algorithm. We talked about the, the basic spectrum of the flap care. And remember in the beginning of the slide, the, the challenge with our center was that we had a 22% of major amputation in 2005, but using these kind of multi uh, disciplinary approach and uh, microsurgery and super microsurgery, we were able to reduce our major amputation rate to 2.4%, which is a significant drop and we're able to improve the life quality of the patients uh, and not only the wound healing itself, but the quantity of life as well. So where are we going from here? I mean, are we near perfect? So that is the question that we have to keep asking ourselves. And remember, the soft tissue aspect is about coverage, but you almost, uh, and, and if you look at in these ischemic patients, when we do a flap on these ischemic patients, what is very interesting is that as the flap heals, the flap is able to increase the surrounding tissues um, transcutaneous oxygen level. So what does this mean? So it actually means that the pressure, the, the uh, oxygen tension becomes high in the tissue, high in the flap, and then it migrates into the tissue and actually able to elevate uh, the surrounding tissue um, oxygen pressure. So the flap not only provides coverage, but it has a potential to actually increase um, the oxygen content of the surrounding tissue uh, working as a nutrient flap. And this was reported uh, in the 70s. What we also have to understand is that the flap works as a nutrient flap, additional function in addition to coverage, but also we have to understand the concept of orthoplastic uh, reconstruction. So here's a patient with a transmitted tarsal amputation we used a small artery to hook it up, and this is the final result. But look how this is ulcerated. So what would you think? Why the patient ulcerated? The reason is because the patient had a tight Achilles. And if you release this Achilles, this wound, because it does not abnormally uh, bear weight anymore, it improves. And this is why it's very important to understand the functional aspect of reconstruction. So you cannot go soft tissue separate, bone separate. You have to understand together and ultimately bring the best results. So that's another um, way to make sure that you don't have future breakdown. And we call this preventive reconstruction, thinking about the function, thinking about the kinetics, and of course, doing the orthoplastic approach to diabetic foot reconstruction. Another key question that a lot of our colleagues from orthoplast or, or uh, orthopedics ask is when we do this kind of reconstruction. I mean, what's the use? Because we know that eventually the thumb will migrate inward and the fifth toe will also migrate inward. So ultimately this patient will have abnormal weight bearing as well as exposed um, first and the fifth ray. And you can see that it has been medially migrated over the years, over the seven year course of this patient. So in the past, it has been advocated that uh, instead of salvaging one or two toes, maybe doing a transmetatarsal amputation has better function. And in a way, it's true. When you do transmetatarsal amputation, the patient has less minor complication. But when you do transmetatarsal amputation, the patient has more major um, uh, complications, including major amputations. And the, the gait, when compared to having remnant toe, even though the minor complication goes up, the major complication go, comes down. And what's interesting is that these, uh, uh, ultimately these toe will, meet, will migrate medially and the patient will, yes, need additional, potentially additional amputation, so more minor surgery. So what does this mean? But as long as you have this toe, you actually have better functional gait. So now we're able to tell our patients, uh, if you have remnant toes, you might have better functional gait. But if you remove everything, you might avoid uh, minor surgery, but there's a higher chance of major amputation. So now we're able to tell the patients, um, uh, despite the fact that this was not the common idea in the past, now we try to reconstruct, salvage as much toe as possible and have the patient understand that this procedure will have either more minor or ma more major uh, complications.
So we have the patients, we're able to give this data to the patients and have the patients decide on this reconstructive process. In, other, in addition to this, now there's a lot of nerve surgery going on, TMRs and RPNIs. And this is very significant because when amputation is unavoidable, after amputation, uh, these patients um, have a lot of complaints in regards to phantom pain uh, and neuromas. So now uh, a lot of our colleagues and in our center as well, we started to do target muscle renovation where you're basically um, having the end of the nerve putting into the nerve uh, of the target muscle. So the nerve grows into the, uh, the muscle, uh, muscle nerve, and then it, it is able to alleviate the phantom pain. So this has been used very widely in, um, in the reconstructive arena as well. In, it, in addition to that, now we're starting to use robotic prosthetics. So as you can see here, uh, we're using robots to actually have a better quality of gait, uh, especially when the patient climbs up and when the patient climbs down. So this is a significant development. And we hope that the future we will be able to integrate patient's nerve into the robotics and create a bionic or cyborg. So we're now doing these kind of RPNIs where we're making these kind of nerve terminals. And as you can hear, see here, using these nerve terminals to actually measure the, the, the nerve signals. And when you're able to measure these nerve signals, we're able to use this uh, into the robot um, uh, robot circuit, and by picking up these muscle signals, the robot circuit tells the, the, the robot uh, what to do. So this has also been a huge development in our field using TMRs to do um, uh, to prevent uh, phantom pain and neuromas, and also using RPNIs to actually uh, build a robotic prosthesis for the future. So this has been a really exciting and incredible ride in the surgical field of innovation. Now we're using robotic prosthesis. Uh, when we think about amputation, we're doing TMRs and RPNIs, uh, creating the fundamental uh, platform to use uh, robotics. Uh, there has been a lot of innovations in the microsurgery, in addition, using small vessels and using super microsurgery uh, as well. So that is the recent innovations that I feel that uh, I would like to share in regards to the non-surgical and the surgical innovations. Thank you. This was an overall review of how a plastic surgeon or a reconstructive surgeon approaches diabetic foot. Notice that the multidisciplinary care is important and the collaboration among other specialists will lead to the best possible answer. So with that, thank you for listening and I hope to answer any questions. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Hong, so any question participant can type in the chat box so that uh, we can ask the question to, we can forward to Dr. Hong and after he finished surgery, he may be able to reply. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So now we'll go for a break. You can please write in the chat box and we will uh, again join back at 3 p.m. because Dr. Professor Rajmani, it is you from UK. He will spend his time 7 a.m. morning. So he will be on on 4 p.m. means 3 p.m. in Malaysia time. So we'll be on at back on 3 p.m. in the same link. Okay.